Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, An Intergalactic Obliteration of the Cosmic Fine-Tuning Argument. In this video we're going to be looking at the life as we know it objection. So, the Cosmic Fine-Tuning Argument states that if the cosmic constants were any different than they are, then life as we know it would be impossible. Basically, the life as we know it objection says that there might be other life that exists in the universe, or could have existed, that does not depend on the fine-tuning of the cosmic constants. So, basically, because the life that we see is fragile and could not exist without fine-tuning, that does not mean that all life could not exist without fine-tuning. A distant planet, for example, might have life that's roughly tuned, see a previous video, or many other versions of the cosmic constants could have still allowed for different life that we don't see in our universe. Just different life that has different kind of constants related to it. Here we're going to look at now four different responses to this objection and some in turn, objections to those responses. So, one might respond by saying, with other constants, the universe would have collapsed or expanded so quickly that no life could form or exist. One might also say that life inherently requires the universe to be fine-tuned. No matter what kind of life we're talking about, the universe must be fine-tuned for it. One might also say that no other kinds of life are possible, just the life we've discovered is the only possible kind of life, so the cosmic constants must have been fine-tuned for that life, there is nothing other than life as we know it. And finally, one might say that this just means that the universe was fine-tuned for life like ours, as opposed to other kinds of life. So. Look at the first objection that with other cosmic constants, the universe would have collapsed so quickly that no life could form or exist. First off, imagine a kind of life that exists at a much slower time frame than we do. One of our nanoseconds is millions of their generations. Though it might seem to us that there was not enough time for anything to live very quickly as the universe expanded and then collapsed, they might perceive it as longer than our entire history. Just how something that experiences time much faster would not think that there was enough time for life to form on our planet before the sun died. Basically, it's all about a matter of perspective how quickly things pass. We only think that would be too fast because it's too fast from our reference frame. Something else might think that it took, in fact, a long time. Also, we don't know what would happen if the entire universe collapsed on itself. Who knows what would happen if all the matter in the universe were at a single point, basically. Perhaps another Big Bang with different cosmic constants? Maybe a new stable state in which life, in fact, is able to exist, just in a very, very different way than we would conceive of it now. Overall, it seems that just because with certain cosmic constants, the universe would collapse or expand very quickly, doesn't preclude life, just perhaps, once again, life as we know it. Perhaps then we would say that life inherently requires the universe to be fine-tuned. Well, this seems to simply return to Objection 13 from a previous video, that fine-tuning is a poorly defined concept, as it's just relative to scale or the units that you're using. Depending on you using big enough units, everything seems fine-tuned to a certain degree. And so, if life were small enough, nothing would be fine-tuned. So, to say that all different sizes of life require the universe to be fine-tuned seems to just be biased towards our perspective of fine-tuning. If you take the perspective of the smallest possible kind of life, surely that life is not requiring the universe to be fine-tuned in the same way. And any argument to support this must demonstrate that all possible types of life require the fine-tuning of the universe. This seems pretty hard, because unless the proponent can demonstrate that we have in fact discovered all possible forms of life, causing this to just devolve into the next response, it seems that there is no way to show that even hitherto undiscovered life requires fine-tuning. Basically, 
it does not seem that there's any way for us to kind of show this universal affirmative that all life requires the universe to be fine-tuned when much of the life is something that we don't even understand what it might be like. Now, the next response might be something along the lines of no other kinds of life are in fact possible. So this objection seems to depend on your definition of life. If what you count as life boils down simply to kind of a biological description describing just the exact kind of life that we have seen on Earth, then it might be correct, but trivially so. Such a definition of life means that if some other being that had a chemical or biological makeup very different to ours appeared on Earth, landed, but seemed to have consciousness, we'd be forced to assume that, in fact, they were not alive, but something else, just merely conscious. But in that case, we can just reformulate the objection as one which talks about consciousness as we know it, not life as we know it, because life is too tightly constrained, but life is just not what we're talking about then. That term just doesn't become useful to us anymore. And it does seem that we're getting closer and closer to creating something very like life in technology. While we may not have reached that point yet, it's debatable, it seems that to insist that artificial intelligence is impossible just is really short-sighted based on the extreme advances we've had in computing over the last 30 years. And if we will ever count computers as life sometime in the future, this response seems ineffective and just clearly false. So what about our last response? That this just means that the universe was fine-tuned for life like ours as opposed to other kinds of life. Sure, other kinds of life might have existed in other finely tuned universes to other constants, but the reason it's special is that we, our kind of life, could only exist in this kind of universe. At first this might seem very convincing, and yet in fact is going to take away the entire force of the original cosmic fine-tuning argument. So, imagine that every single alteration of the cosmic constants has a different kind of life that could develop in such a world. This means that life would exist no matter what the constants were. But this means that if the constants were in fact determined by chance, then there's nothing special about our world over any other beyond us being in it. In this case, there's no more reason to believe that God exists because our kind of life exists than to believe that just because you won the lottery, God made it so. And even if you think that maybe only half the universes have cosmic constants, or only a quarter of the universes have cosmic constants in which life can exist, it's only then a one in four chance. You still don't get the astronomical odds that the cosmic fine-tuning argument claims to be able to put out there. You just get However, the percentage of possible alterations of the cosmic constants that allow for some kind of life out of the total number of iterations of the cosmic constants. The point is this is another case kind of like the lottery paradox. Basically, if there has to be some winner or there has to be at least a one out of two chance that there is a winner, then it's not ridiculous odds, even if you have a huge amount of entries, because there always has to be a winner, or there is a one out of two chance that there's a winner. So it's that one out of two chance we have to look at, not the astronomical odds. It's the difference between a specific case being the case and any case out of there being the case. Or perhaps our universe is fine-tuned, in fact, for a different kind of life that we yet have yet to discover by some god that's very different than our conception of god, a god, in fact, of that kind of life, not us. We're just a consequence of that god's creation, because perhaps that life needs the universe to be more finely tuned than we do, and we are a necessary consequence of the universe being as fine-tuned as they need it. If this is the case, sure, a god exists, but it's definitely not our god. We'll deal with this more when we get to Ed's perfect design and that objection. Finally, there's a further problem with imagining that we're the only type of life in the universe. This would assume that God is not alive. If God is necessary, as many theists claim, then he exists in all possible worlds. 
Therefore, either God is dead, not alive, or there exists life in all worlds, no matter what the cosmic constants are. And there exists some kind of life other than life as we know it, namely God. The point is that if you're using this argument to prove God, God seems to be a different kind of life, or else God is dead. And if God is a different kind of life, then you've just destroyed your own response to the objection that the only kind of life we have is life as we know it. That was the life as we know it objection. Next up, we're going to be looking at the confirmation fine-tuning argument, followed by the problem of the priors for fine-tuning, Ed's perfect design, and finally, Karl Popper and cosmology is not science. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.